We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Thank you very much. Now that it has officially opened our panel, or sorry, our town hall on AI inclusion and diversity from the different uh, four different continents. Well, so joining with me, with us today, uh, are four great specialists. This is a is an, an event that we propose as uh, as different organizations comes together to an interesting partnerships called Triple AI Partnership. Uh, which means ITS Rio, the organization I'm representing, but also BI from Norway and Bergman Klein Center from the US. So already from, from the start, we were an open-ended partnership focusing on different views of AI. But joining with us today as well, we have um, panelists from the University of Western Cape from South Africa. So focusing on this four different continents and trying to propose interesting views for the future and for the whole globe. The idea of the panel today is to have a, a frank and, and very open discussion from what are the, the main risks and concerns in terms of AI, but also what are the main opportunities and ways to mitigate our risks and concerns. And the idea of having this as a town hall is to provide an opportunity not only for us to have this panelists, very open-ended panelists and this, their interesting views, but also to propose in the second part of our discussions, also open the floor for the contribution of different uh, members of the audience. And for this contribution, we have three possibilities. We'll have in the second part, an opportunity for people to open their mics and talk, but also they can con contribute continuously in the chat, which will have our great moderator, Christian Piesler here from BI as well, looking at the chat and, and trying to help us with this moderation of the chat. And also we have a third option is that we'll have a mural where we'll use a new type of technology so that we can, during the, the whole discussion, propose interesting ways and, and catch interesting ideas, concepts, uh, phrases, uh, sorry, words in, in during with this mural. And with that, we'll have the, the help of Janaina Costa, which is also a researcher at ITS that will help us with this new technology. And throughout the session, she'll post the link so that we can, can check what are our discussion today. So going for the first part, so together with us, we have four panelists. So some, some essays from uh, BI Norway, which is a professor there as well. We'll have uh, Sandra Cortesi, which is director of youth and media from Beckman Klein Center. Uh, we'll have Selina Boutino, which is director of project um, ITS, Institute for Technology and Society Brazil. And uh, professor Sean Pater from the University of Western Cape from South Africa. So give the floor to them for seven minutes each for them to give us a little bit of a, their points of view, what are the main concerns, what are the main risks, what are the main opportunities, what are the main mitigation factors and how they see this playing out in the next five to 10 years. So seven minutes each. So we can start with Samsung, you have the floor for seven minutes. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Christian, for the in for introduction. So, um, I'm originally from Africa, but here I'm here I'm here to speak a bit more generally about the development initiatives in Europe. Sean will take care of the African perspective. Uh, uh, so, um, of course, um, I think one of the questions for the panel for the panelists was, what are the main concerns? What are the silent features that are driving? AI uh, discourse in relation to inclusion and diversity in Europe. And uh, I think a fundamental concern or one of the main drivers of AI, at least the discussions are often in Europe framed around respect for fundamental rights. Uh, so 
this conception, this framing of fundamental rights uh, often takes a central stage. And here, when we talk about fundamental rights, we have, of course, several of them. Uh, so the right to uh, protection against non-discrimination, non-discrimination based on race, gender, uh, sexual orientation is one important fundamental right recognized under the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. The right to data protection is another important right, which is uh, which is recognized under that uh, that framework as well. And of course, we have other uh, other also uh, fundamental rights which are considered to be threatened or affect impacted by by the use of uh, by the use and de uh, deployment of AI. I want to highlight some two concrete cases which actually attracted some attention in the last couple of months uh, in Europe. So the first. Uh, the first uh, event or uh, case is uh, the use of AI systems for basically for providing grades to students. So I think many of you have heard about these things. Uh, so as a result of the pandemic, many governments and uh, exam, uh, examination assessing institutions had uh, to cons to find new ways of providing grades because students were not able to sit for the regular ex exams because of the pandemic. And of course, many, many institutions uh, turn to AI and artificial intelligence uh, for providing this, those kinds of grades, both international organizations, but also governmental institutions. Uh, and this has uh, this has for, uh, led to some public outrage, uh, for example, in the UK, after the uh, UK uh, examin uh, qualifications and examinations office used AI systems to kind of um, um, align or to kind of um, uh, to use AI systems to uh, modify or uh, assess, assess the grades given by, by teachers then many students actually took it to the street because they found that the use of the AI system actually discriminated based on their, uh, their socioeconomic background. So the data basically showed at least data uh, that was uh, some uh, media, uh, media reported that actually the algorithms benefited or uh, benefited schools or students from schools with a privileged uh, uh, neighborhood. Uh, because uh, the algorithms, uh, in the algorithms, uh, the, uh, the, the examination office also took account of previous performances of schools. So uh, that was that led kind of to this uh, to this uh, demonstrations in the UK and in other parts of the uh, the uh, also uh, parts of the world. And this is perhaps one of the few instances where the use of AI systems actually led to public outrage. And another example, uh, which uh, which is more recent, is that in, in this year, uh, the the whole Dutch government ha was forced to resign uh, because of uh, a scandal involving involving a child benefit scheme. So uh, the the scandal emerged uh, uh, after the tax authority, the Dutch tax authority, implemented an algorithm to kind of detect. Uh, frauds in child benefit claims. And this algorithm has uh, apparently mistakenly identified around 20,000 parents as, as potential fraudsters or as fraudsters. And of course, not surprisingly, many of these parents have had uh, an immigration background. So the problem was that uh, because of the few instances of uh, actual fraud cases that, uh, that were associated with immigrant parents, the algorithm had learned that uh, and generalize that immigration background as an important factor for, for, for potential fraud also in claims of uh, child benefit. So these are some of the concrete cases that actually show uh, the concerns that EU is dealing and the concerns that, uh, that are driving the discourse in, in, in Europe. And of course, in terms of um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the initiatives uh, that we have had, uh, uh, Europe have had already existing legislation that kind of protect that provided some kind of protection. Uh, for example, the GDPR had some provisions, uh, particularly Article 22, which deals with the protection against uh, uh, solely automated processing and the right to contest automated decisions. So, uh, for example, in the Dutch case. 
the Data Protection Authority has already uh, imposed the fine on the tax, Dutch tax authority based on the GDPR. So we see that there is already some, some existing legislation that providing some solutions to the, to the problems. But of course, there are also major legislative initiatives that many of you are aware of. Um, and one, one particular legislation is the uh, proposal for Artificial Intelligence Act or the AI Regulation Act. A regulation which was unveiled by the European Commission in April uh, this year. And this is a very ambitious, perhaps this is the first very comprehensive legislation uh, addressing, uh, specifically addressing AI systems that uh, touch different sectors. And this is a very ambitious and complex uh, proposal. So we won't have time to look at uh, the details of the proposal. And I'm sure that may, there are many panels in IGF uh, talking about the, uh, this proposal. But here I want to focus a bit on some of the, uh, some of the provisions that actually touch up on this issue of inclusion and diversity. So uh, the objective of the uh, the objective of uh, the proposal uh, for the AI Act is basically a human to have to establish a human centric AI, uh, an AI system that respects fundamental rights, an AI system that respect that uh, that uh, that is robust, accurate, and and trustworthy. So you see that the con that uh, the fundamental perspective, the fundamental rights perspective, again comes central. In the objective of in the objective uh, of this uh, this regulation. So based on these two factors, so based on the protection of fundamental rights, trust, uh, security, and safety of those systems, the uh, the proposal basically adopts what is referred as a risk based approach, and identifies three categories of AI systems. So the first category is basically. AI systems that are considered to pose an acceptable risk to fundamental rights, safety, and security of individuals. So, if you are, if you are, if, you are, if the AI system falls into this category, then it's prohibited. So, it means that you cannot use it or deploy it within the European Economic Area. The second category is uh, AI systems that are considered to pose high risk to fundamental rights and safety and health of, uh, of individuals, and here. Uh, those, those AI systems have to comply with a detailed set of regulations and specific requirements relating to risk management, data governance, uh, transparency, and human oversight. And apart from those obligations, then there are requirements of confirmity assessment. So you have to also produce a, a third party certification or assessment showing that you actually comply with some of with those requirements. Uh, that are set up under the regulation. And then the third category is low risk AI. So in this kind of AI, then there are only some transparency obligations associated with this. I will briefly touch upon some of these, the first two categories, they, those are unacceptable uh, AI systems that AI systems that pose high uh, unacceptable risk and AI systems that uh, pose high risks and uh, some of the issues in relation to inclusion and diversity there. So in relation to uh, the first category, which is uh, some of the AI systems that are considered to pose unacceptable risk, there are four categories of uh, AI systems. Uh, I won't be able to go to four, four of the systems, but just to highlight one of those areas, uh, the, the, uh, the proposal or the act, the proposal for the act prohibits the use of biometric identification in real time in public spaces. So basically, uh, uh, the, uh, the regulation says that it's not possible to use uh, facial recognition technology or biometric identification systems in real time in public spaces. This is, uh, there are of course some exceptions, but there is a general prohibition now for the use of real-time biometric identification in public spaces. And we have, we are, I think many of you are familiar with many cases of discrimination uh, based on facial recognition technology, uh, especially in many instances in the US where uh, facial recognition technology often misidentifies people of color uh, disproportionately and the impact that have on minor, people with minority, minority background. 
And we have seen, at least in the US, some, some, some states have started to introduce bans on the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement. So here we see that the EU is also moving towards that kind of prohibition of the use of such biometric identification in public, in public spaces, of course, with some exceptions where this system might be allowed. And uh, in relation to the second category of AI systems, AI systems that are considered to pose high risks, uh, there is a long list of uh, AI systems that fall within this category, uh, which I'm not able to go through. But uh, to look at some of uh, the list, uh, so we have uh, AI systems that are used in education and vocational training. So if you are using an AI system to decide access to education, that would be considered a, a, a high-risk AI. Uh, or if you are using AI system to assess grades or tests that are required to enter to this education institution, then that would also be categorized as a high risk AI. So the case we have had in relation to uh, the protests in the UK for the use of algorithms would be would be, would fall into this kind of category. So it would be a high high risk AI, and then the user or the, or the provider of that AI system has to comply with very specific detailed obligations under under the uh, the, um, the the regulation. And we have also the use of AI systems for employment and recruitment purposes. So. Uh, we have had also similar experiences where AI systems that are used to, uh, for example, um, sort out CVs often end up discriminating some groups, uh, women in some cases, and also people of color or people with certain names, with Islamic names. So that would also be considered as a high-risk AI. And we have also the use of AI systems in for, uh, for deciding public benefits. Uh, such as social security, social security benefits. So the Dutch case would be covered here. So if, if you are using to assess eligibility of social welfare benefits, then that would be also considered as high risk AI. And there are of course, uh, lists of also AI systems in relation to assessing of asylum in the use of AI in judiciary or in law enforcement, for example, for purposes of uh, assessing sentencing, uh, the length of sentences, which often also are very, very discriminatory practices. So these are, uh, these are some of examples. And uh, if, if an operator or a user is using one of these AI systems, then they have to comply with a set of obligations, as I mentioned. And here we have also obligation in relation to uh, risk management, obligation in relation to technical documentation, uh, transparency, uh, security of the systems, accuracy of the systems. But I want to highlight one, one particular obligation, which is relation, in relation to data governance and data quality requirements under, under that, uh, that obligation. And this is Article 10 of the proposal, which basically sets out an obligation that if you are a provider or user of one of these high risk AI systems, you need to have a data management framework that ensures the trustworthiness of that system. So among others, this requires the user or the operator to have uh, a data set, any data set for testing, uh, validating or developing the system has to be a relevant, complete, representative and error free. So basically, uh, and of course, we know that many of the discrimination cases we have had, uh, at least the majority of them are related to the lack of representation in the data set. So this provision under, under the AI Act is basically trying to remedy that, that problem uh, that we often see that leads to discrimination of certain groups because they are not represented in the data set that is used to train the AI, AI systems. But so this obligation basically imposes that you have to, uh, to have a representative data set and that the data set has to be complete and then error free. And this would be also assessed based on the conformity. So before putting the AI system into the market, you have to make sure that someone has to confirm that you actually have have uh, complied with this obligation. And what's interesting is that uh, non-compliance with this obligation actually also results in the highest uh, fines under, under that, uh, that proposal. So it can entail you up to 30,000, 30 million euros or 6% of the global 
annual turnover of a company if a company does not follow or does not comply with this principle, this rule under, under that proposal. So that is, that is something interesting. Fantastic, Samson. This so, you have you gave a very broad overview of the main the main questions that have been uh, in the EU concern, and and we can go back uh, to specificities or in relate to what are the main uh, solutions that have been uh, have appeared in this proposal of an EU AI Act. That is, thank you very much for that. Um, so that we can, we can move continents a little bit and to have a little bit of a, a, a broader overview uh, with that. I will call upon Selena Botino, the, the director of project ITS to give us a little bit of a point of view of Latin America and particularly of Brazil. Hi, Chris, thank you. Well, thank you and hi to all of you in the panel. Uh, so I'll try to be quick so that we can have a, a more fine formal conversation. Uh, but I would like to, uh, since we are talking about AI inclusion and perspectives here from the global south, uh, I would like to uh, give like a, a big, uh, some few steps uh, back before focusing on uh, AI specifically. But it's always nice to remember that uh, ITS together with NOC, the network of centers and Berkman Klein Center have already been discussing this topic of AI inclusion since uh, 2018 when we had the opportunity to do this big event uh, down in Rio, which I think now it's time maybe to have a second edition, right? Uh, and well, but so then was uh, the time uh, we started to try and frame uh, AI discussions with this lens of inclusion and and, the, and we had just uh, back then some like research questions would, would emerge and, but now I think we have advanced uh, a lot on uh, the uses and more, and we have more to discuss. But I would like to focus in some points here, as I mentioned, that uh, when we talk about AI, especially I'm looking in Brazil, for example, uh, specifically, there are some issues regarding uh, connectivity, infrastructure, uh, data ecosystem, and education that I think are very important to be addressed. So, because there's still a global divide on the quality of connectivity, right? Considering and considering that most AI and all, I guess, applications will depend on a certain type of connection, it's uh, having a good internet access is crucial for any use of these applications. And we're still unfortunately lagging behind as for example, Brazil uh, has considerable amount of people that are not yet connected and not with uh, a good connection. And I think one point that illustrates this is the fact that still our public schools are not connected to internet. So they do not have access to any of these uh, technological solutions that are used in, in schools. Uh, and we had um, now in the pandemic where Brazil was the place, was the place I think that schools were closed for the most time, more than one year with schools closed. And the only way it was through online education and people from public schools, unfortunately were uh, in practice were just without any access to any kind of education because they just didn't have how to get to this, uh, to to the content, and so I think this shows how uh, important some we need to to fix at some crucial uh, tools, let's say, for the use of, of technology and AI as a whole. Uh, and another important point is the data infrastructure that is necessary to feed AI applications. For example, right uh, when you use self-driving cars, they will be used in, they will be using maps, a kind of Google maps or any other sort. Uh, and there are still many regions that are not mapped. And when I'm not talking about uh, remote regions, I'm talking about uh, places uh, right in the middle of Copacabana, one of the most uh, famous neighborhoods in Rio, where the community, uh, the low income community that exists over there, just right next to the, these, these big buildings, high buildings, just not appear the map. So you could see how still um, important not to uh, mimic the exclusion that it still happens on uh, 
an offline offline role, let's say. Uh, and another point is the quality of data, right? Because there is a lot of um, a lot of work to be done to transform our data into machine readable data. And I think uh, the health sector is a good example where you could use a lot of uh, AI applications to help uh, better organize the service. And it's still we were talking with some uh, developers that were trying to to see some solutions on the sector, but they just said that they didn't have uh, data to work with. So they, unfortunately they were leaving the country to try and develop their ideas somewhere else because they just didn't have the raw data to, to work. And another point of data, which now uh, it's getting, uh, Brazil didn't have until uh, two years ago, a data protection law, but now it's, we already have it it's still, but still very much uh, it's in the beginning of its application. So the, the importance and the concern with data protection is also something that uh, it should be, uh, should be noted. And the other point is the, the issue of education, right? And the need of reskilling. As we saw, uh, for example, uh, there are a lot of national plan, strategy AI plans, they focused on this topic, right? Which is crucial for, especially when you're talking about uh countries here in the global south that if we're not if that education is the gateway for people to be uh included and connected to these uh new possibilities right and so what are the what is the plan that a country should be looking for uh regarding uh preparing its population to use and to develop and to be also pro producers and not just consumers of this, uh, this technology. Unfortunately, we did not see much of any of that on the AI national strategy. And just before to wrap up, uh, I just very, very briefly overview of the Brazilian AI national strategy, which was published this early on this year, which uh, got people frustrated because uh, it had, it, it was the result of a public consultation, which was very, uh, nicely done let's say because it was a uh, very much multi-stakeholder it was put for people in all sectors to contribute researchers industry uh but the result did not um uh, did not reflect all the all the contributions that were were, were done in, in the context of the global of the public consultation so the result was more like kind of uh, a mapping, let's say, of the AI principles that we are, we are seeing uh, everywhere, but uh, it lacked uh, more uh, strategic points or specific objectives, like what what we would like as a country and how we would like to position ourselves, and that was not there. But uh, I know that there's going to be a second round of discussions to have a second version of this AI strategy, which we believe uh, it will be uh, hopefully a bit better than this, this other one. Uh, and lastly, um, Brazil uh, regarding regulation, even though we have all these, these problems that I mentioned, uh, even though our Congress is very much excited and thinking that they really should regulate AI like for yesterday, as if they were a very serious threat or something that really uh have that it makes them think that that's a real urgent matter which uh so it was already um approved in one of the houses uh with no and especially in this context of still the kind of pan pandemic where not much uh conversation was managed what well, happened so the differently from the process of the of the strategy this uh the discussions uh, regarding the Bill of Law re regulating AI was not uh, multi-stakeholder, it was not, op not, not much open and did not have even time to discuss, even especially on this issue, which is really need a lot of discussion. We see like how Europe is taking its time and really uh, looking into it and suggesting frameworks and we're just uh, rushing through. So uh, that's something, <laughs> thinking about what countries should learn that's something that uh, should not be uh, uh, should not be repeated. Let's say from uh, elsewhere. But yes, uh, I would just to finish with a positive note is is the importance of any uh, initiative that try to regulate these topics 
that it really should uh, be uh, truly multi-stakeholder and with especially with time enough time to to discuss right because uh, any uh, rushed regulation could impose also barriers for innovation uh, and then cr create other problems right so and there are always and there's other suggest other possibilities for like sandbox regulation or prototyping legislation and trying to put like uh, separating right like uh, Meta has this project I, I loot I forgot the name but it's just tries and uh, tests a specific uh, project uh, legislation on a real world AI application and then observe how it would work and then go back and discuss if it makes sense or if it had the intended results, if not, how to adjust. It. So I think I'll leave it here and uh, happy to hear the rest of the panelists. Thank you, thank you, Selena. So if we have a, a, an issue there is about diversity, it's about uh, discrimination, it's always interesting that you bring everyone together. So probably a step forward is actually having this mood stakeholder points of views and that's very interesting as well. But now let's let's uh, let's go with uh, Professor Sean Patter to give this his views from from South Africa and Africa as a, as a whole. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, yeah, thank uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm I'm wondering. I prepared a few slides. Is it better? I might just have a more structured way if the host, uh, the moderator, can enable the screen sharing. Let's see if I'm allowed to do so, but give me sure. one section. If not, I'm just gonna talk through them. I'll see if I can. I think he, you have you have a co-host uh, uh, status, so probably you will be able to, to share okay. the screen. All right, look. yes, thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah. So apologies for that. Uh, so that's. I, I thought it's just better, and hopefully I could just keep to the time that was allocated to to me. Um, I'm not going to. I'm going to take as given the many arguments we're already familiar with, the arguments that have driven us towards having a session like this around impacts of inequality and diversity. So I think they're well documented, and we continue to document it. But in thinking about Africa, I think I must. I must quickly reinforce the state of digital inequality in the, uh, on the continent. Um, I, I, I've just extracted a few bits of data from the ITU's uh, 2021 publication on facts and figures, which as you, for those who are familiar with this, know that it basically is a comparison of, of, of data from across various continents. So firstly, just from the perspective of simple, simple use, and I mean, one cannot talk about the AI, about AI and its applications without ensconcing that within the internet work, because the internet work essentially is what's driving much of the inequalities and other perspectives we talk about. And, and here, as we would see, if I can just pick up a laser, right? And so we can see where Africa is sitting there across the rest of the world. Again, in terms of, in terms of by location, urban versus rural, and there's substantial rural populations in Africa, especially, and we can see, and compared to the rest of the world, you know, the continent is not well positioned. If we think about mobile network, because that's most, um, uh, that's what's serving the greater numbers of populations in the continent. Again, you could see compared to the rest of the world, where, you know, more than half still have 3G and then 2G co connectivity. The issue of affordability is a serious matter, and you can look at all the reds and the pinks here, where the um, GNI per, cap per capita costs greater than 10, between two and five, between five and 10 in this continent. Uh, and I suppose not that different from, from, from uh, Southern America compared to the rest of the world. And then lastly, the issue of skills. And as you can see again, in terms of, and, and the ITU gives basic intermediate and, and, and more advanced skills. This is just basic. And as you can see here, just from the coloring that, you know, we're zero to 20% and there's not much happening across the rest of the continent. Of the continent. So as a starting point, the issue is that digital inequality is already very prevalent on the continent. 
some of the key pillars that underpin it are those around skill, the infrastructure quality, affordability, and that of uni universal access. And, and it's interesting because I've been working in this area for many years and um, by and large, the market forces seem to drive operator and for-profit models. And for those who need, we need to bring into the digital era more continues to lag behind. So I think the opening point around the issue of, of inequality we we'll talk about is that there's already a very uh, severe problem of digital inequality. I did a little bit of looking at to see what I could find around the continent on policy. Oops, wow, I don't know what happened there. Um, okay, on, on, on policy discourses. So nothing much. I tried to see whether the AU has, has formed anything. So I've got some comments out of this event that took place last year um, and where the fourth industrial revolution was very much on the agenda. And just I've just extracted two quotations out of, out of a press write-up for that. Um, because this talk of the African digital transformation strategy and the focus of the strategy from an African perspective is about this is being seen as a leapfrogging frogging opportunity. In other words, we are down here in terms of, of the digital stakes and with the advent of four IR technologies, there's a sense that, well, perhaps Africa can leapfrog and put ourselves up front there in terms of where all of these emerging technologies go. Um, just because I'm more familiar with South Africa, again, I asked, well, is there any part of our policies that begin to even examine issues of inequality and, and, and the rest? Of course, our, the, the constitution of South Africa, which is well known for the way it was developed, does kind of give the underlying protection. Then we have like a national development plan, which focuses on smart technologies, nothing about inequalities coming through. Urban uh, development plans, again, focusing on uh, efficiency and service delivery. We developed an e-strategy in 2017, again, which looks at smart cities. The National Integrated ICT Policy White Paper, which is our overarching ICT policy document, speaks of a digital society, emphasizes privacy and security, but that's kind of where the policy discourse stops. So out of where the policy is and thinking of government, I mean, the, the issue for me is, is that there's a perpetuation we are studying the perpetuation of digital inequality. The average poor person is already digitally excluded. There's a proportion who has access and use to basic ICTs, those who are, con who are fortunate. And I say this at large because very often for, for people who, who operate in the mainstream metropolitan areas of the continent, we forget of the reality of large numbers, swathes of the population who are outside the metros. By and large, in Africa, most of the main key metros are not that bad off in terms of where they are situated in infrastructure. So the fourth industrial revolution technology developments, including AI and machine learning, tend to focus then on, on not, I don't focus on how they, we would support social and economic development, right? So that's the first problem that's going to perpetuate digital inequality. And the fact that AI is driven by data. And the fact that large numbers of people are not even active on digital platforms means that they are going to remain outcasts. And so that underscores then the notion of inequality that's going to continue to happen. So the current focus has to shift. Um, we've made a lot of progress in terms of privacy and protection. So for example, in this country, we have an act, very well conceived act, but the discussion debates and policy, policy frameworks which are focusing on how do we grow the economy? How do we make new industries, new manufacturing, et cetera? And how do we leapfrog? But without thinking to the possibility of how we overcome issues of poverty, right? We are going to entrench those social and economic problems. They will loom large. And that's the concern as we move forward is that we're not focused and the focus is going off in one direction only. So to finish off, I, I, I listed a few inclusion and diversity concerns. And I think some of my colleagues who have spoken just now uh, uh, might overlap a bit, and especially with the Latin American uh, presentation. Um, I've made this point about the digitally uh, um, uh, 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 ma uh, marginalized become more marginalized. And these statistics, I'm not going to repeat that because I've made the point. The divide between big and small business, most countries in the continent have micro entrepreneurial activity as the center stone of driving economic development. 
But what's happening when, I, when we look around the environment, AI technologies is being driven by big business, multinationals in terms of where they are focusing the, 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 the objectives of, of applying this. And the potential is going to exist because if the economy, economy has become skewed towards as 4IR takes bigger root, is that we're gonna create the separation between big and the smaller players who need to entrench themselves to drive economic growth. That's the one concern of inequality. The issue of skills. Now, once there is some documentation and some work that, that suggests that, that the new technologies are gonna create more jobs than those that will be lost. And the expectation is that we're gonna reskill, retool. But I don't understand, my personal view is that I don't think in the state of high unemployment rates and the levels of poverty, that the current unemployed are gonna have a better prospect in a world that's dominated by these emerging technologies. I'm not sure. I don't think the evidence actually tells us that. Um, so the potential, and, and I think colleagues have already spoken this about social inequality that's going to be entrenched um, is, is, is quite clear because more and more decision-making is lying on AI technologies in the background, sometimes in ways that we don't even realize. I see I'm out of my time to moderator, so I'm going to finish, but I think this is the last one. And I'll stop here uh, and maybe in the discussion we'll, we'll pick up others because I'm out of my time. Here is a good example of how um, AI was used for political manipulation in South Africa, where Twitter bots were used to drive a particular agenda and drive the notion of a concept called white monopoly capital, which fueled huge and massive racial discord just a few years ago in South Africa. And it was unchecked until it was founded. So these are all of the potential concerns. I have ideas around how we mitigate, but we're out of time and I'm gonna leave that then to, uh, and the look, my looking ahead thoughts to the open discussion chair. I've exceeded my time by one minute, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, it, was a, it was a great overview and I, and I really see many overlaps between different regions and particularly Latin America. So you are quite right that, uh, and particularly on, on the sense of diff, different, uh, issues on digital infrastructure and the digital divide and how it will impact AI, not, all, not only development, but also implementation in the future. So thank you very much for that. And now we can have uh, our four panelists looking from the standpoint of media and youth, Sandra Cortesi uh, from Berkman Guy Center, US. Thank you, Sandra. You have the floor for seven to nine minutes. So much. Uh, please make me a call even though you confirmed that already, but please uh, make me a call, thank you. Sorry? Oh, fantastic, thank you very much. Okay, you can hear me and you can see my slides, yes? Okay, uh, so let's try to be brief. So after Europe, uh, Latin America, Africa, I'm here to share some perspectives uh, from the US. My name is Sandra Cortesi. I work at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, maybe as a footnote or as a caveat, because my background is in psychology, I tend to not represent uh, the views related to kind of law, legislation, or even regulation. Um, so I asked essentially my colleagues at Berkman Klein for some help uh, in this regard. And so here is some inputs that they said that may set up, set, set off my, my conversation or my seven minutes. Uh, so I asked them what is going on in the United States related to artificial intelligence. Here are some observations. One, uh, things are happening, but the things that are happening are mostly happening at the state level versus the federal level. Um, two, AI is most often regulated on a sectoral basis. Uh, the emphasis, when there is a kind of uh, emphasis, the emphasis is on autonomous vehicles, AI in the judiciary system, policing and credit worthiness. Um, and then at the federal level, emphasis is placed on research and development rather than regulation. Maybe one noteworthy development from this year, uh, earlier this year, uh, essentially the National Defense Authorization Act uh, passed, was approved by Congress. 
uh, one of the well, one of the AI related elements within that act is the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act, which uh, mainly focused on improving national competitiveness in AI uh, via research and development investment, improved interagency coordination, uh, education, the topic very dear to me, and standards development. The law facilitates soft law guidance and may instigate enforcement action. What is truly interesting to me uh, about this act is uh, two, uh, two specific things. One is related to the lack of AI talent. So uh, it talks about the development of an artificial intelligence science and technology workforce pipeline. Uh, and the second required activity that is very much of interest to me is the implementation of an educational program or curricula, not only at the post-secondary level, but also in the K-12 realm, which is usually uh, where I connect uh, to where I connect to this because my focus is on young people ages 12 to 18. But if you have specific questions about uh, the National Artificial, Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act, please don't hesitate to my two colleagues listed here on this slide. Okay, so inclusion and diversity in the public discourse, something I follow very closely, uh, tends to focus often on uh, the uneven access and possible biases or discriminatory impacts of AI-based technologies on different populations. We heard it a couple of times already uh, with the focus on kind of the disturbing risk of amplifying digital inequalities. When in the US, when we talk about populations, we tend to refer to uh, uh, or include at least urban and rural poor communities, women, youth, LGBTQ, individuals, uh, ethnic and racial groups, or people with disabilities. Again, in the public discourse in the United States, I would say women and ethnic and racial groups are uh, most often centered in the discourse but uh, the, the one community I'm very interested in uh, is, of course, this youth community. And so I, 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 I thought I use my couple of minutes to talk a little bit what's happening at, in this youth realm. Um, for sure, we can say we're at the, at the very beginning of understanding the impact of artificial intelligence on young people. And not surprisingly, this lack of evidence in research is also reflected in, in the different policy documents. If you look at all national AI plans, uh, it has become a little bit better, but if you, this is uh, the visual is from a mapping that UNICEF did, uh, I think in 2019, where you could see that also in the US, uh, youth issues or youth topics are never mentioned in the national AI plans. A little bit more is happening uh, since then, but I think there is still a lot to, to catch up with. To end, essentially, I wanted to share two observations from conversations with young people in the United States that may impact how we think about law or regulation in the United States and beyond. The first observation from those conversations with young people is that we as adults and young people, we often use the same terms, but we refer to very different things. That is important because if you write something into an official document, uh, likely this is written uh, in, in form of how the adults think about it. Uh, a very prominent example of this is privacy, also in the AI uh, debates and discourses, where privacy for a young person means something very much uh, connected to social and interpersonal uh, elements. So they think about parents, friends, teachers, where as adults, we think about, we have an institutional or commercial concept of privacy. We think about governments and companies. And so that is important as you write protection of privacy or things like that into, into something that uh, the perspectives may clash on what that, that concept even means. 
Uh, other elements related to privacy could be the, the concept of surveillance, one where young people have a different perspective. Again, it's much more related to surveillance from adults, uh, adults they know. Other uh, concept could be the question around autonomous vehicles, where so far young people are not able to drive, where autonomous vehicles may uh, mean something very different than an 18 plus year old or 16 plus year old uh, individual. And the last concept uh, related to AI is this question of personalization. I just had a really interesting conversation uh, with young people two days ago, where when they think about personalization, their biggest fear is uh, fear of manipulation and landing in kind of this filter bubble. And in their minds, they would like to have an on-off switch for personalization where they can see the, the information as it portrays to their interests, but also able to switch it off and would be curious to see how adults think about it. And to end, the second observation from young people is in order to be relevant to young people, it's important to consider different approaches. Obviously, uh, law and uh, regulation is one way to go about it, but the, another way would be to think more broadly about education. And so that connects it back to the beginning where I started. Uh, I think particularly as things move relatively quickly and um, young people learn as they go as well, I think uh, law often and kind of interventions in that space lag a little bit behind. So education is something important to consider. And if this is your topic, I very much recommend this report we wrote, uh, we published 2020 that talks about uh, education broadly, including artificial intelligence. And we did a mapping looking at who is actually talking about education and AI. Uh, in short, very few. Uh, and so we are trying to overcome that by developing AI tools and lessons that anyone can access. 35 languages, also an AI uh, Creative Commons license. Uh, and last but not least, just to flag a uh, new policy guidance on AI for children that came out last week, developed by UNICEF and other institutions, uh, highly recommended as a reading resource. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Sandra. It was fantastic. And one of the main interesting things that we have uh, of this thought, this kind of discussion is that we have not only four different views from four different continents, but four different views from different genders, different people, different understandings, and obviously from different backgrounds as well. So your background in, uh, with uh, youth uh, psychology and youth and children, it's fantastic. And it, and it, it fascinated me, your point about the on and off switch of personalization and manipulation. This is sort of a something that uh, not only for the youth, but particularly for the youth, it, it is uh, quite interesting. So now we have about seven minutes. So what we can do is first open the floor for if there is anyone to talk to. If not, uh, we can... Uh, if, if Jenna can help me, we can showcase a little bit about the mural that we have been doing throughout your four, uh, your four contributions to this, to this discussion, and, uh, which, which was quite interesting. If you look at the, uh, the mural now, you will see that there were lots of things that we, we, can, we, can, we have discussed during this uh, 50 minutes that we were in our town hall discussions. And if you see sort of a, some of the, the risks and, and potentials concerns, they, they kind of are to a certain extent similar, but also they, they refer to different uh, situations. So they refer to some technical aspects, they refer to some rights aspects, they refer to some specificities concerning uh, infrastructure, uh, specificities concerning what are some certain groups might be uh, impacted by AI. For instance, when you talk about skills, when you talk about uh, uh, surveillance, I find it quite interesting the point of uh, Professor Sandra also mentioned surveillance from the standpoint of youth is not the same surveillance as Sansom was putting in, in the beginning, talking about uh, facial recognition in the public, the public sphere. When you think about surveillance, it's not only that, but also surveillance from their parents. This is also an issue that can be can be discussed. So what we, we can we can open the floor now from for the next five minutes then is to discuss a little bit about uh, what you think about the next 10 years. So if you can wrap up your views in about a minute, 
uh, that would be fantastic. And we can finish in a high note, thinking about what are what it is the uh, panorama for the next 10 years on AI, if you can give, I, don't, I know it's going to be hard, one minute to do that, but let's do, let's, let's try and, and share our views on, on that on that note so let's let's uh start from a different point of view let's start with professor sean patter and then move out move around a little bit on that thank you do you have the floor um, for final sure. remarks thank you I, I think i'll just focus on one issue there are a couple of ideas but the one is i think from the african perspective we need a more structured and coordinated response in terms of ai governance um, an international framework. So we have the OECD principles on trustworthy AI. There's a global in index on responsible AI being developed. And I think if we have a universal framework and under which we deal with then country level tweaking and implementation of the framework, because ethics differ from continent to continent. So regardless of where technologies are developed, they will be subjected to a common set of, of, of AI related ethical issues that we can develop in concurrence under the banner of the UN. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic point, fantastic point of coordination. So if I can call Selena, you have one minute to give your final remarks and seeing the future in 10 years, what you think it's necessary. Well, thank you. Well, uh, I think uh, what is necessary for uh, these uh, next years would be maybe uh, a massive in, uh, investment in trying to mitigate and uh, all these connectivity issues that we mentioned and which is similar uh, to what uh, in Africa too. So uh, get at least the, the minimal infrastructure in place. Because I think there are a lot of possible and positive also examples, which I just learned about AI, a Brazilian AI application used to help uh, accessibility of people that cannot write and move, which they just can do it by using their blink of their eye. I'll just share here. So uh, I think there are many things to, to uh, positive things to happen. And uh, I'm optimistic. Thank you very much. There's also investments, also a very important point. Sandra, you have one minute. So my hope for the next 10 years would be that we increase youth participation in these debates, but not only in the debates, but that they become, that they get a seat at the table and become designers and developers of AI-based systems. How to do that, I will post in a second in the chat, but uh, thank you very much for having me. Fantastic, fantastic. That, that is a very interesting point. Also, we were talking about mood stakeholder, but also multi participation holders as well. It's quite a, quite an interesting point of view as well. So, so now you can finish up with all of the discussions. Uh, send some. You have the floor for the next minute. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, in Europe, I think the main focus would be in getting the legislation that are uh, in place at the proposal stage and then passing them um, to law. And I think uh, one important thing to emphasize in the, in the uh, legislative proposal is this idea of focus on fundamental rights of uh, individuals. So the right, uh, the right to their privacy, uh, the right to, uh, to protection against non-discrimination. So I think that, uh, that the focus on those aspects would be uh, something that we need also elsewhere, not only in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. So I think I hope that um, we will see similar similar protections legislations coming out with the focus on that on that aspect. Yeah, I think I will, I will stop there. Thank you very much, Sandra. I think that that's that's the main point of, of to finish now. Uh, we finish with a very interesting high note of participation with stakeholder about looking at financing uh, and organizing the future and obviously passing on legislation that focuses on, on the rights of the people that are most 
badly affected by, by this. So I think there was a great town hall discussion. Thank you very much for you all. Thank you for our, uh, our group, our partnership, our three triple AI partnership. And thank you, Professor Shantata, to participate with us all. And thank you for the background and the IGF people that uh, have helped us so much uh, and that I could not mention every single word person, but I know that they deserve our thanks as well. So cheers, and I hope we continue this discussion further in different events in different fora. Cheers. Thank you, bye bye. bye. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye -bye.